We have been on this topic, Experience Jesus and His Church, coming from the book by Pastor Mel, Experience Jesus and His Church. And last week we talked about a couple of things I just want to review quickly because we're going to dive a little deeper into it today. Last week we talked about how the church is God's vehicle for the world to experience Jesus. And the center of all the teaching of the Bible is this person, Jesus Christ, and who he is, and how he comes into our lives, and how we can experience his grace, and his power, and his freedom, and his deliverance, and his forgiveness in our lives. And the church is the vehicle that God has designed and planned for the world to experience Jesus. Jesus also said to his followers, go into all the world and make something. He didn't say make a great Sunday morning service. He didn't say make great worship CDs. He didn't say make books that will help people. All those things are important. What he said we're to do is we're to go into all the world and make disciples. And the church is God's tool. It's God's instrument to shape our lives and to make us and mold us into an image of Christ in our lives, that we would become disciples of Christ and become like him. So Jesus saves us, but the church shapes us into who we are. This morning, I want to continue on. I want to read the first instant in Scripture where we see the word church in the Bible. And we're going to unpack that a little bit, and we're going to learn a little bit from that. And then we're going to talk about one of the pictures of the church in the Old Testament and how that picture of the church really unwraps and unfolds for us what the church is to be and how we're to accomplish the mission that God has given us. Again, the mission is that people would experience Jesus and that people would be discipled to become like Jesus in their lives. Amen? So we're going to start reading with Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples this question. What are the people saying about me, the Son of Man? Who do they believe that I am? They answered, some are convinced you're John the Baptizer. Others say you're Elijah reincarnated. Or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But you... Who do you say I am, Jesus replied. Simon Peter spoke up and said, You are the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, You are favored and privileged, Simon, son of Jonah, for you didn't discover this on your own, but my Father in heaven has supernaturally revealed it to you. And I give you the name Peter, a stone, and this truth of who I am will be the bedrock foundation on which I will build my church. One of Jesus' most bold declarative statements of his purpose for coming to earth is this one here. There are several places that Scripture records where Jesus makes a very clear and bold purpose or mission statement. And he makes one here. I will build my church. This is what Jesus is all about. I will build my church, my legislative assembly, and the power of death will not be able to overpower it. Why don't we all say this together? Lord, teach me something I never knew before and help me to grow in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for your presence here today. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would be here with us as we talk about the church, your vehicle, Lord, that people would experience Jesus, that they would experience transformation in their lives. Lord, help us to understand and to learn and to grow, to make this personal in Jesus' name. Amen. So the religious leaders, if we read a little bit of the context before this moment where Jesus has this this moment with his disciples, the religious leaders have been pressing Jesus to prove who he is. They've been saying, Jesus, who are you? Who are you really? Prove it, Jesus. Jesus, show us a sign to tell us who you are. And Jesus won't answer the religious leaders because he knows the motivation of their heart isn't right. Show us a sign, they say. And so Jesus, at this time, takes his disciples aside. He's getting close to approaching the time when he is going to die on the cross. 
when he's going to make the ultimate sacrifice for mankind. And he needs to know that his disciples, the ones that he, have pour, he has poured his life into, have a revelation and an understanding of who he is. And so Jesus chooses the moment and the time. It isn't a mistake that he goes to Caesarea Philippi. And I want to take us on a little journey this morning. I've got a, a picture of where Jesus took his boys for this object lesson. That right there in the background is Mount Hermon. And Caesarea Philippi is at the base of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon we hear about several times in the Bible. One of the most clear is Psalm 133, where it says that how precious it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. It's like the precious anointing oil. It's like the dew on Mount Hermon. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is there when we're in unity. So Jesus takes them to this place, Caesarea Philippi, and he actually takes them to the next picture that I'm going to show you. At the base of Mount Hermon, he takes them right here. And that cave on the left is called the Gates of Hell or the Gates of Hades. At Caesarea Philippi, there's a stone wall that you can see there. And all those shrines are shrines to different Greek gods. And there was a temple at the time when Jesus was there called the Temple of Pan. A temple to another god. And it's in this backdrop that Jesus has the conversation with his disciples. I can imagine them standing, Jesus with his back to the cave, the gates of hell. I can imagine Jesus standing, looking at his disciples, and they look past Jesus, and they see all the different gods of the nations on the rock wall behind them. And in this setting, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? The central question of all history is who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Jesus. The central question that we still have to ask ourselves today is who is Jesus? Jesus stood on the rock and he was going to establishly, establish clearly with his disciples who he was. So they're looking at Jesus and they start giving him many answers. And in fact, if you'll study the New Testament, you'll find the great controversy of the New Testament is this question, who is is Jesus. This was the controversy. The foundation of the church is at stake here. The foundation of Christianity, the foundation of our very faith is at stake with this question, who is Jesus? So I would ask you today, who is Jesus to you? To many people today, he's the unknown Jesus. They would say, well, I can't really know for sure. They would be agnostic. They'd be like, I believe there's something out there but I don't really know, and I don't know if it's this God or if it's that God or if it's Jesus or who it is. They have an unknown Jesus. For many people today, they have the historic Jesus. Well, I know that Jesus was a person who lived about 2,000 years ago, and I know there are a lot of stories written about him. They have the historic Jesus. For some, Jesus is a great man. They have the great man Jesus. He was a good teacher. He taught people to love one another. He taught people to accept each other and to be kind. And he gave us good lessons to follow. They have the good man. Others say, the Muslims especially would say, he was a great prophet. We know that Jesus was a great prophet and he spoke from God. If you talk to the JWs, they would say they have a different Jesus. He's not part of the Trinity. He's not God manifest in the flesh. He's a different Jesus to them. The Jesus we have is different than all of these, amen? Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is who he is. This controversy would carry on right through the New Testament. We would see books written to, to churches, especially to Colossians and to the Hebrews. And those books would go into great detail understanding and unpacking this idea of who Jesus is. To the Pharisees, Jesus claimed to be something that they said he was not. One day, the Pharisees were questioning him and talking about Abraham, the father of their faith. And Jesus looked at the Pharisees square in the eye and he said, before Abraham was, I am. 
Now, I am doesn't mean a lot to you and me in our Western culture, but I am to the Pharisees was the very name of Jehovah. Jesus was saying, I'm the beginning, I'm the end, I'm the eternal one, I'm the one that existed from the beginning. In fact, John would go on to write in his Bible, in the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word took on human form, and it came, and the Word walked around among us in our neighborhoods, and we touched it, and we felt it, and we saw it. And we experienced the living word of God. Before Abraham was, I am, I am Jehovah. The Pharisee said, no, you're not. You're just a man. Prove it. Come on, prove it, Jesus. Prove that you're more than just a man. Nicodemus came and said, Jesus, you're a good man from God. So who is your Jesus? This question is central to the church. We have to build on the foundation of the truth of who Jesus is. It's the question that everyone still has to grapple with today. Every person alive today needs to decide what they believe about who Jesus is. I was visiting my dad on Friday morning, and I was kind of sharing some of these thoughts about who Jesus is and how this question is important and central to our lives and central to the church. And my dad kind of looked at me, and you know, he's half paralyzed and has a little trouble speaking, but he looked at me right in the eyes and says, Mark, let me tell you something. If people don't know who Jesus is, they're in trouble. And I looked at my dad and said, you're absolutely right, Dad. If you think Jesus is just a good prophet or just a good man or just a good teacher or just a historic figure that lived, guess what? You're in trouble. You need to settle this question in your mind. Jesus is the son of the living God. He is a member of the Trinity. He existed from eternity past until today. His life didn't start in Bethlehem. It started before the world began. Amen? The eternal son of the living God. And so Peter says these words. He says, and Jesus answers him and says, this truth of who I am will be the bedrock foundation. The bedrock foundation on which I'll build my church. You know, when Jesus comes into your life, when he becomes real to you, everything in your life changes. Nothing's the same anymore. Things that you couldn't overcome, things that you couldn't fix, things that you couldn't deal with, Jesus comes, becomes real and he comes into your life and he makes all the difference in your life. Amen? He is the foundation of our faith, the beginning and the end. He's the cornerstone. We're all stones in the church, by the way. So the Bible says Peter is a stone in the church. John is a stone in the church. The apostle Paul, the prophets that came after Jesus, they were stones in the church, but Jesus is the cornerstone. And we're all stones together in his church. Amen? And Jesus in this setting says, I'll build my church and the gates of hell the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What a great object lesson that is for us today. Why don't you say it with me together? I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Bible. I believe in the gospel. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the church. You know, a lot of people have kind of funny, mystical ideas of what the church is. The church is... You know, kind of all of us together, it's this ethereal sort of, sort of non-physical thing that's just out there somewhere. And I'm in the church when I'm here, and I go there, and there's four of us there, and we're in the church, and we go over here, and we're the church. And they kind of have this idea of the church as this sort of unbodied thing out there. And the Bible doesn't give us a picture of the church like that. Other people see the church as a place to go. It's something good that I can do on a Sunday morning. It's a place where I can be entertained a little. I can be lifted up a little. I can be encouraged a little. I can feel a little bit better about myself. And they add the church to all the other things that they do with their lives. For other people, they see the church as a place where they can get some help. I need a little help in my life. I'm having a hard time. I'm going to go to church and get some help. For others, it's a place where they can raise their kids or where they can find someone to marry or where they can build their lives a little bit more. But the church that God gives us in the Bible is a much deeper, bigger, broader picture than that. 
Kevin Gerald says the church is God's plan, and he doesn't have another plan. He doesn't have a second plan. The church isn't a mistake. The church is plan A. There is no plan B. It's the final plan and the only eternal plan of God. In fact, if you study the scripture, you'll find that everything in the scripture leads up to the church, that the church is of paramount importance to God. And the church doesn't end when the world ends. The church goes on for eternity. It's his family. It's his body. It's his bride. It's his temple. The church is the finality of everything that God is doing. I like to think of this, that God saw you, and he saw me, and he planted us in the church in this moment of history and in this place as a building block for his eternal purpose. The Bible says that God looked on chaos. In the creation story, we see that God looks upon the, the, the world and there's chaos and there's lack of order and he speaks into it light and he brings order and he creates it that he creates man in his image and in his likeness, knowing that man will fall, knowing that even though he creates man in his image, man will fail and that man will need saving. And the Bible tells us that before the beginning of the world, God had a plan to restore us in right relationship with him. All of this points to Jesus, a creative plan, a predestined plan, an eternal plan, a church plan. We're in the church, and this is what it's all about, guys. This is what it's always been about. The church is God's plan. Here are four reasons that Jesus came into the world. Number one, Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. We find in Genesis 3, the very first prophecy in the Bible, that he will strike his heel and he'll crush his head. Amen? We see that prophecy. Jesus came to restore the works of the enemy. Number two, we see that Jesus came to give life, life now and life eternal. Amen, that he came to deliver us out of our sin, out of our poverty, out of our sickness. He came to set us free and to give us a better life now and eternal life forever. We see that Jesus came to teach us how to live. He doesn't just save us from our sin, but he teaches us how to go forward and how to build. We see Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, some of the greatest teaching of Jesus on how we're to live our lives. But then we see, number four, that Jesus came to build his church. Jesus is all about building the church. I want to take a few moments this morning and look at a picture of the church that we see in the Old Testament. And there are many types of the church throughout the Old Testament. And in fact, all that happens in the Old Testament leads up to what the church will be in the New Testament. There's a little scripture in Acts chapter 7. And this is what it says. It says, this is he, talking about Moses, that was in the church in the wilderness. Now, Jesus uses the word church for the first time in Matthew, but in the book of Acts, the writer Luke refers to the nation of Israel when they're delivered out of Egypt, being led to the promised land. He refers to them as the church in the wilderness. And so the nation of Israel, as they come out of Egypt, they are a picture and a type of the church. So what can we learn from this picture of the church? Well, number one, the nation of Israel was chosen. They were called out of Egypt. And the first thing that God does in each one of our lives as Christians, as followers of Christ, he calls us out of our sin and he calls us to life. He chooses us. And the first thing the church is, is the church is the called out, chosen, separated ones of God. We're called out. The number two thing that we see from the church is they're called out of Egypt and they're gathered together in the wilderness. And we know that Jesus said, wherever two or three gathered together in my name, there you are in the midst of me. Last night we went to a concert with 4,000 people of which I only knew six, but we had church that night. You know what I'm talking I didn't know who those people were. I didn't have a relationship with them. I don't know what their lives were like or what they were going through or what they needed. They didn't know what I needed. But together, we had church in that place. That's the gathered church. We were called. We were chosen by God. And whenever we gather together, that's a picture of the church. And you can have church in the coffee shop. And you can have church at your place of work. And you can have church in your neighborhood whenever you gather together in his name. But it doesn't end there. 
Because the people were gathered in the wilderness and they were all in disarray. And then God speaks to Moses the plan to assemble the people in order. And a lot of people don't realize this, but if you read the scripture where Moses builds the tabernacle in the center and then assembles the people to the north, the south, the east, and the west, it's a picture of the cross in the wilderness. It's a picture of the church. They are assembled. They're put together. This speaks of order and structure and relationship. And then Moses, he would take and put leaders over a thousand, over a hundred, and over ten. And it was structured and organized. So we're called out. We're gathered together. Those are pictures of the church. But then we're assembled and put in order. The church of God is the assembled Church of God, that speaks of relationships and structure. And then the children of Israel in the wilderness, the church in the wilderness was equipped, equipped and trained for battle. They were equipped to go into the promised land and to defeat the enemies in their lives and to overcome and to take the land. They were equipped and trained for battle. And finally, they were sent. If we stop with the called out and chosen, we don't have a whole picture of the church. If we stop just simply saying, well, whenever we're gathered together, we have church. We're not getting the whole picture of the church. If we see that we're just assembled together and put together, the Bible talks about the church as being a building. The Bible talks about the church as being a living temple. It says that we're living stones that were fitly joined together. The Bible talks us about the church as a body. Each joint supplying what the other joint needs. It speaks of long-term life-giving relationships in the church. We're assembled. But if we don't have a purpose together, if we're not equipped to do something for God, then we're still missing the whole picture of the church. And finally, we're sent on mission. Ultimately, the mission of the church is to reveal Jesus to the world and to disciple people to follow him. So we're equipped and trained and sent. And you know that we go into spiritual warfare and battle as a church. We fight a real enemy. There is a real enemy of our souls. The gates of hell that we saw that picture of speak of the power and seat of authority of the enemy. And we have to battle against spiritual forces of darkness and wickedness in our world. That's the picture of the church. There's structure, there's organization, there's leadership, there's authority, there's purpose, and there's mission in the church. When you put it all together, when you put it all together, you have a picture of the church. Amen? The church is so important. I think we all need a new understanding of how important the church is to our lives. A new reality We've got to understand who Jesus is, but we've also got to understand what his church is because it's so important to him. The church is God's plan. He doesn't have a plan B. The church fulfills God's purpose, and the church is a place that we gather together in relationship to hear and to receive from God. Amen? This is another picture in that Old Testament. God said, build the tabernacle, gather at the tabernacle, and I will meet you there. You know, it's wonderful to experience God in your home. It's wonderful to experience God as you drive in your car and you crank up the worship. And you know, you're driving down Channel Parkway singing at the top of your lungs. And somebody goes past you and they think you're like totally whacked out. And you're like, man, I'm just having Jesus time in my car, right? It's awesome to do that. But when we meet him together at church, when we gather together, there's something powerful there. We gather, we're discipled, we grow, we find a place to serve, we're equipped for our lives, we find our home in church. Amen? Jesus said he came to build a house. He came to build a home. There's a place where each one of you belong. No one should be alone at church. Church should be a place where everybody finds relationship, where everybody has value, where everybody belongs. Amen? Church is designed to be the center of life. It's not peripheral to our lives. In fact, in the, in the old days in Europe, the church would be the center of the community. There'd be city hall, and there'd be the church, and they would be of equal importance and value in the city. I think that's a great picture of how we ought to value the church. Amen? 
I want to close with an Old Testament prophecy concerning the church for us today. This is from the book of Micah, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. It's a prophecy about the church in the last days. By the way, whenever you read in the Old Testament, the mountain of the Lord, you can just insert the church there. The mountain of the Lord is a prophetic picture of the church in the Old Testament. This is what Micah said. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all. The most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. There he'll teach us his ways and we'll walk in his paths. Amen. Do you know you need instruction from God every week? One of the best things about coming to church is every week you're getting instruction from God. When you're sitting there in that seat, and it's a nice comfortable theater seat, and you can recline back and you can get all cozy in there, don't just listen to what I've prepared to say. Listen to what the Holy Spirit wants to say. Sometimes it'll be a phrase or a word that I say. Sometimes I'll just spit something out that I had no idea I was going to plan on saying. But other times you'll be sitting there and as I'm speaking, God will be speaking to you about something completely different. It'll start with something in the message and then God will just give you revelation for your week. He'll give you revelation for your family. He'll give you revelation for your finances and your health and your marriage. Amen? It's the most important place on earth. Look at all the things you can get at a church. You can get your soul saved. You can get your mind renewed. You can get healing for your body. You can get restoration for your marriage. You can see your children's lives touched and impacted by God. You can get hatched, matched, and dispatched in the church. Amen? You get your children dedicated and raised up and built up and married. All in the church. It's a habitation. For the presence of God, it's a, not just a place that you go. It's a place that you belong. It's a place that you're part of and a place that becomes part of you. Amen? A place where people can experience Jesus in a real and powerful way and a place where we can be on mission together, joined together to do the work of God, to see people discipled, to see our community and our nation ultimately discipled. You know, I think of Jesus standing in Caesarea Philippi and the, the gates of hell are literally right behind him and all the gods are represented on the wall and Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the son of the living God. You're the one sent by God. You know, there isn't an ideology. There isn't a, a way of thinking. There isn't a belief system. There isn't a government system. There isn't a social system that will ever stand against who Jesus is. He is eternal. Amen. And he will build his church. And we're part of it today. Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that we are part of your church today. Jesus, you are alive. You are as real and present right here today in this room as you were when you walked in Israel 2,000 years ago. You're the one that is timeless from the beginning of time to all eternity. You're the ever-present living God, the Word of God in flesh. And Lord, I thank you as we build this church. God, as we gather together in this church, Lord, that this church, life church, not this building, not this theater, but God, what we build would be a holy habitation for your presence. Lord, that people would experience Jesus because of who we are, because of life church, God. And Lord, I pray that you would open doors into this community for life church. And Lord, for all the churches represented in Penticton, God, open great doors. I thank you that you are alive, that you are real, and that you are moving today. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. How do you become part of the church? Is it a membership form? Is it a card that you fill out? 
Do you just come four Sundays in a row? How do you become part of the church? You become part of the church when you turn your life to Jesus. When you turn away from your sin, you turn away from your mistakes and your failures, and you put your trust in him. The Bible says that you're adopted into his family and that you're planted in the church. It's about relationship with Jesus Christ. He's as real right now in this room as he was 2,000 years ago. He is here right now in this place. And if you don't know him today, if you're watching online and you don't know him today, you can know him. You can make the decision today to turn away from your sin and turn your life over to him. To simply say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, be real in my life. Come in my heart. Change me on the inside. Make me part of your family, part of your church. If that's you today and you'd like to pray with me, I want to ask you to be bold and lift up your hand. If you're watching online, be bold and lift up your hand. You can email us later and tell us about your decision. Anyone here today? One, two, three. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Let's all pray this together. If we could bow our heads for a moment. Let's pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I come to you today humble, asking for your forgiveness. Thank you for sending Jesus, the eternal Son of the living God, the Word of God made flesh. Come into my heart. Come into my life today. Forgive me for my sin. Make me new. Plant me in your house. Adopt me into your family. I turn my life over to you to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen.